Welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today for the virtual roundtable business planning, guiding your growth. Um, I'd like to introduce myself first. I'm Danielle Patterson. If I haven't got the pleasure to meet you, I am the director of Seed Corps Foundation. We're going to be starting um, in just a moment as more uh, attendees are coming in. I'll start the conversation with just a quick housekeeping and um, then some updates on the activities of KITE. So we will be doing question and answer throughout the workshop. So please feel free to uh, put your question into the chat box or raise your hand and we'll stop the workshop so that we can answer. Um, Sue or Todd can answer any questions as we're going through the workshop. Um, KITE, which is the current initiative for talent and entrepreneurship. Um, we are active within Kern County supporting entrepreneurship um, in the area. If you would like to stay up to date on events that we have, um, such as this one, you can go to gokite.org, where we have a monthly newsletter, and that will provide updates on um, continuous events going forward. Uh, we also have the Startup Space application. If you go to gokite.org, you can select join our community. Within the Startup Space application, we have resources, knowledge center, um, which is a learning tool providing business information. Uh, this webinar will be available within the Knowledge Center as well as the templates that have been provided. Uh, the template, everyone should have received a template. If you have not received a template, it was not received in your email, please enter your email address in the chat box and we will provide that for you. In addition to uh, the Resource Center and the Knowledge Center on Startup Space, we have a COVID-19 resource. That COVID-19 resource has local and national grants and information relating to businesses that have been impacted by COVID-19. The other benefit is we have a virtual community. Um, entrepreneurship can often be a lonely journey and we want to support connecting you with other entrepreneurship entrepreneurs within our community. Uh, now I'm going to introduce Sue Watson and Todd Nyberger, uh, our speakers for our presentation today. Sue Watson is the CEO and founder of Business Initiatives. She is a business consultant, leadership and strategy expert, coach, author, and speaker with 25 years of experience spanning four continents. Todd Nyberger, which is the CEO of TEN, TTN Fleet Solutions, a Texas-based company providing on-demand transportation maintenance solutions. Todd has global industry experience, including manufacturing, distribution, and services. Thank you so much for joining us and we look forward to your questions. Excellent. Thank you, um, Danielle, for introducing us there. So we're gonna get started with the template. I think I'm gonna share that on the screen so that you guys can look at it as we're talking. It's probably more important that you look at that than us. Can you see it, Danielle? Am I sharing my right screen? <laughs> Sometimes I worry in case I'm sharing something completely different. So, so we start off by thinking about um, this template. I like to think of it as, an, as a napkin approach to business planning, which sounds a little trivial maybe, but you know, when you go into a restaurant and you're sitting down with somebody and the ideas start flowing and all you've got to write on is a napkin, you pick up your pen and you're scratching on the back of a paper napkin. And um, this is a two pager that I think Todd will attest to the power of creating everything that you want to create for your business on two pages. So that's where we're gonna start. So the top left-hand corner, you'll see Core values, one, two, three, four, five. You probably don't want more than five core values, probably three to five core values. And Todd's going to share with us uh, how he came up with the core values for TTN. But I just want to say, why do we start with core values? Because as you're building your business, you want to know clearly what you're about and what you stand for. And you also want to be able to quickly refer back to these, coach to these, hire to these, Buyer to these and all of this good thing. So, Todd, what have you got to say about core values at TTN? Sorry about that. I had my cell phone mute. <laughs> Thank you, Sue. Um, from a standpoint of core values and um, where we're at and with the company, I mean, the core values, like Sue said, is it's something that you take a look at as really a reflection of who you are, the company, um, and 
to define simply what those five core values is what you hire, the way that you train, the way that you manage, um, and really just the way that you run the day-to-day -day operations and the vision of, of what that company and, and your company and who it is. So when TTN took a look at the core values, um, there is eight of us that I refer to as the elite eight, and they, they are our directors and up, um, the executive team and three other individual directors. From that standpoint, what we did is we took a look at really what tries to define um, and threw out just everything that came to mind. And it took a process. It was probably a good um, three to four days of, you know, going through, understanding, looking what it meant. But when we came back, what we really looked at um, that defines who TTN is and what we want to make sure that our customers understand. And we came up with the five core values. And our core values are integrity, respect, positive, collaborative, and serve. And those five core values really define TTN. They define, if I looked at each one of our executive members, um, our directors, and then from our staff that, you know, within the organization, it's something that, you know, when we're in an interviewing process, we'll take a look at the individuals and, and ask ourselves and actually um, during the interview, ask people of, you know, what's their thoughts of, of integrity? What does it mean to them? Um, what is your thoughts of um, respect and positive within the culture and, and the workforce. So we spend a lot of time um, really defining the core values and, and then living those core values. And when Todd says it took four days, it didn't take them four whole days. They started throwing out some suggestions and then they narrow it down and then they hone in and then they really think about what it is that they want to create. And the joy of this is you can change it. It doesn't have to be stuck in stone, but you need something to just be a guiding principle for your organization. So on collaboration, for example, with Todd's company, if somebody calls me and they want a coaching conversation, I'll simply ask them, well, have you collaborated? And we can just guide them back to those core guiding principles anytime that we feel the need to do that. So moving on, then we start defining the mission of the organization. Well, some of you, you know, even myself, like back in 20 years ago, 15 years ago, I was like, why do I have to know why I exist? But again, what you've got to see is that this is like creating cornerstones or a foundation on which you can grow. So you really want to know why do you exist and who do you exist for? And that, that sounds like an easy question, but right now I'm working, for example, with a group of farmers and they really need to hone in on who their ideal client is. And they'll hone in on their ideal client. And then that will be answering that question, who do they exist for? So you don't wanna be all things for all people because that's not conducive to having a highly efficient, highly profitable business. So, that, so if you can answer those questions, why do we exist? Who do we exist for? That will help you a lot. How has that helped you, Todd? Well, I think, again, from our standpoint, you know, the mission from our side is, you know, you have your goals of where you're at and where you're trying to lead to that mission. But really, why do we exist? And, and what we came up with is from our standpoint is that we're a trusted solution to solve complex problems. Um, and in the industry that we work with is the fleets is to solve these complex problems for the fleets um, and, the, and the services that we provide. Excellent. Excellent. So I want to draw you another little picture. So I'm going to stop that share screen for a sec. And I'm going to draw you a little picture here of where we're going today. So basically, if you think of your business on a timeline, if you think of the conversation that we're having on a timeline, where we've got this right hand vertical streak is a five year point. And then we've got a three-year point, and forgive me if my lines are not exactly horizontal and vertical, a three-year point, and then we've got a one-year, and then we've got 90-day uh, segments in that first year. So remember that what we're doing is we're creating this timeline, and it starts with the furthest away point. So when we're looking at the five-year goal, we're looking at this point here,
and we're looking at um, where do you want to be in five years? Like a, you take a javelin and you throw it and it really sets the direction for you. So with the five year goal, you don't want anything uh, that's too detailed, but you do want something that's quite specific. So it could be a revenue goal. It could even be an exit plan for if you're a very aggressive startup and you want to exit, it could be an EBITDA goal or it, you know anything like that, but it just throws the general direction that you want to go in as a, in the, in the UK, they have this saying called throw your cap over the wall. And it's you throw your cap over the wall and then you work out how to get there. And that's very much the philosophy of this plan is you determine what you want and then you work out how to get there. Todd? Yeah, when we took a look at this um, within the organization, and again, the Elite Eight, um, we sat down and, and really tried to look at the vision and um, laid out the five-year plan. And then um, what you'll see with Sue and throughout her leadership training courses that you go through um, and the visionary courses is, is really looking to create your future and to look at where you're at today, but to put yourself in the future of that five-year plan. And then how do I work backwards to try to get to that five-year plan. And from the standpoint of laying out, you know, what do we see at the end of five years? What are we going to accomplish with a 30-day milestone to get to 90 days? Where's our market one year, three years to accomplish that five year? And so it's a process that you have to go through and it's a process that to get your entire, um, what we refer to as the Elite Eight, but our management team on board um, with where we're going with that. And so what we did is we set out our five-year plan of where we were going to be within a revenue, uh, where we were going to set milestones with our EBITDA. And then truly at the end of five years, what we thought our goal was, and truly from the standpoint of where we are, is that the company's been in existence since 2010. Um, we know that we have some great um, partnerships, but we know that we also are looking to either bring in private equity, um, go public, or have an exit strategy in five years. And so that is where we're at. And that's the goals and the five-year plan that we set down and looked at it and then filled everything in to get to that future um, from a revenue and EBITDA goals and worked our way back um, from the very beginning. So if you then go over to the right-hand point, if you know where you want to be at five years, if you're clear on where you want to be at five years, then you have to work backwards and say, okay, if we're there at five years, where do we need to be at three years? At three years, what do we need to have accomplished that will make us know or allow us to know that we're on target for that five-year goal? So that's where we fill that in, but we start putting a little bit more detail to it now, a little bit more meat on the bones, so to speak. So it could be, well, we need to have a new building by then. We'd need to be relocated, or it could be, well, we need X number of million-dollar customers or... It could be we need to fully utilize the software or we need to replace the software. Or we need a new accounting software, anything like that. Can you can you give us some meat on what you established there, Todd, for your three year goals? Yeah, when we took a look at that, you know, the thing is, is, is truly to focus again that we're in the in the service industry. And um, I think for those that don't know us, um, the best way to describe what TTM Fleet Solutions is, is that we're the back end software platform. Um, for any size fleet within the organization of the industry for emergency roadside breakdown or for maintenance. Um, and so from our standpoint, when we looked at that goal is that we know and we set out that from our standpoint that, you know, we knew customer service excellence had to be one of the top things that we took a look at. How are we the best in the industry on customer service? Um, we looked at the other side of it saying is that we want to be a one-stop shop for maintenance. How can we be a one-stop shop for maintenance? And then broke it down into that standpoint that knew from our technology to our customer service and then what all needed to be into that and start looking at that three-year plan and building out those separate divisions or silos to get there. Yeah, so I'm working with another client right now with this master plan and some of the things that they identified as wanting to accomplish in three years was to have their accounting function running smoothly, communicating and integrated with other parts of the business. They want an all-star team in place. They want a reward and recognition program implemented because for them it's super important that in three years they have industry best people working for them. 
Uh, they're going to be doing some development of property. So they want zoning changes done on a piece of property that they own, the development plan complete, those kind of things. So whatever is relevant for your business, that's where you want to go with the three-year plan, remembering all the time that you're on a timeline. So when you're on the three-year plan, then you start going in and honing in really into some detail of what you're looking for. And you can see that at this point, you can start dividing and conquering so that you're not solely as the, as the lead in your business, you're not solely responsible for all of it, but you're responsible for making sure that somebody else is responsible for getting some of the work done. So then we go to the bottom left-hand corner of the plan and which is down to the one-year plan. Well, here's a mistake that's often made is if you try and do everything in one year, you're gonna fail. You're gonna fail on most of it. So we would say probably goals for the year are probably between, depending on how many people in your organization, probably between three and seven goals for the year for your organization. Otherwise you're gonna take on too much and you're not gonna get any of it done. So you really wanna start prioritizing. It could be as few as three things that you wanna get accomplished in the year. But uh, that will really make a big forward push for you toward that three-year goal. So each of these, each of these uh, positions on the timeline, you want to be really clear on what it is and that everything you're doing in the moment gets you to 90 days, one year, three years, and five years. Todd, you want to take that? Yeah, so when we took a look at our one-year plan, um, again, from our standpoint, um, my background <clears throat> from as a CFO and then stepping into the CEO shoes, you know, one of the big things that we knew we needed to drive was EBITDA. And so what we looked at from the standpoint is that one year plan is, is and breaking that down is that um, one of the goals of the first year is to have an increase of 3% in our gross margin. So as simple as saying, okay, if we look at year five, year three and year one, let's work backwards, is if in year one, we can get a 3% change increase in our gross margin, that's gonna put us on target for year three and year five. So that was one of our um, year, year one on the plan for the goals is a 3% increase in gross margin. Um, another, and, and again, Sue's saying, identify those and make them simple, make them something that you really can hold people accountable. Another one was to see a $17,000 increase um, in work orders. And when I say not 17,000, 17,000 work orders and work orders is what defines um, our business. And so basically the average price per work order on our side is about $600. And so what we looked at that is that how many work orders is it going to take to double the business, triple the business? And so we put that in place for the first year. Um, we looked at also things that we could say from a dispatch standpoint of how long it took us to answer the phone versus our goal to try to make sure that we increased our customer service in that first year. Um, we looked at labor per work order. How can we drive labor costs down per work order? Um, and then one of the other big key factors that we looked at from our standpoint is employee retention. We saw from our standpoint turnover within our organization and why there was turnover. And we did employee surveys and tried to get as much feedback as we could, but really to try to increase um, employee retention. And, and so those are some big ticket items that we put in place for year one. So you, you're starting to see that Todd's running a, an established business already. And what's important about what Todd's saying is that all of these things in year one are measurable. So you look at your year one goals and you say, and can I measure this? How, how do I measure this? How do I make it measurable so that I know I'm on track to meeting those goals? Now, in a startup company, it could be something else. It could be like raising capital. It could be hiring key people. It could be having an office location or having a manufacturing location. It, it, whatever it is that's relevant to you. But again, you don't actually have to spend that long creating this. In fact, I'm hoping that some of you are almost creating this as you go, because if you do, if you create this as you go, then you'll, you'll probably ask the right questions. So you can tap in to uh, the knowledge and experience that Todd and I have of not only starting businesses, but running successful businesses and driving growth in successful businesses. So your year one goals need to be measurable. 
And then you get into the company 90 day objectives. And again, it's like when you look at that one year plan, when you look at what you want to accomplish in one year, if you're going to attain that in one year, what do you next do? What do you need to do in the next 90 days to drive into that direction for your one year goal? So initially you look at your company goals and you say, okay, here are the priorities. I just want to stop and say one thing. What you're doing here is you're creating the future. You're not fixing stuff. So we actually want you to stop trying to fix things in your business if you've already started it. I know some of you, I can see some of the names on the list. You know, so for example, Debbie, you're on the call. I appreciate that. You've got a business that's already up and running. Don't look at this as fixing anything, especially your one year stuff, because if you focus on where you want to go, there's nothing to fix. There's just what's to do. So once you've got your one year plan in place, you want, again, probably not more than three to seven company goals for the quarter, things that you want to accomplish in 30 days, and you write them down like it's a done deal already making sure that that leads you in the direction of your goal. So Todd, when you're talking about this, maybe you can align your, your 90 days to the one year goals that you've just spoken. Yeah, so one of the things from our side is, you know, if we took a look at saying our, our one year goal, let's just take, for example, the first one is, you know, how are we gonna increase gross margins by 3%? Um, one of the things that we took a look at is that, well, you know, what contracts are up for renewal with our customers? You know, how can we in the first 90 days go back, take a look at customer contracts? How can we go back and look at additional services with the existing customers and what we can provide to them that we can go back and look at increasing pricing or sell additional services to increase gross margins? You know, one of the things on our side is, is the contracts. Um, are they up for renewal? Are we up for um, a change in the delivery and the mechanism of what we're going to from a customer service standpoint and one of our big things is technology. So how do we push technology that basically tries to take out elimination of so much human interaction on the call or the when the call comes into our call center and try to implement some technology in place? So those are some of the things that we took a look at as we started to put in place the one year plan, but to really break them down into 90 days um, and then try to execute on those 90 days and assign within your team who's responsible and then hold each one of those individuals accountable as they continue to try to drive it down um, to their teams. So once they've got those 90 day deals lined out, it doesn't really stop there because as Todd says, you want to assign those goals to a specific person now so that at the end of this meeting, everybody knows exactly what they're accountable for. And then everybody that's in your executive team, and you might be at this point an executive team of one, or you might have some key players around you already, but whoever is there in your team, ultimately everybody in your organization needs to have at least one 90 day objectives. So your executives probably need around three 90 day objectives. And again, you state your 90 day objective in line with your one year, knowing that if you accomplish these things in 90 days, you're heading down the right path to get to your one year, to get to your three year, to get to your five years. So you've allocated them, but there might be that somebody on your key team, your, your executive team, your, your key leadership team has not got any goal yet. So they need to come up with their own. So they could be divisional goals or they could be um, something that you see as a priority, but everybody agrees on. So that, what else is there to say about 90 days? Oh yeah. Once you've got everybody lined out with 90 day objectives, they then need to go away. Whoever's been allocated that goal, you want to send them away and have them come back with 30 day milestones toward that goal. So we're really driving this down to really what they need to do in the next week. So once they've got that 30 day milestone, Todd, you have a weekly meeting, right? And at that weekly meeting, what's the conversation around those milestones? It's pretty quick and short and to the point, right? Yeah, it's, you know, 
like Sue's saying, is what you've done and, and to get where you need to get is breaking it from five to three to one and then from the one-year plan, breaking it into the 90 days and then the 90 days down to 30 days. And we have um, what we call you know our weekly Elite Eight meeting and it's truly looking at those milestones and what you've put in there for that 30 day or 90 day period and what the status is um, with those milestones. And if if you're not meeting where you need to be, you know, you're truly held accountable and there is discussions of why or who you need to get involved or what's the reason of not meeting those. So, um, it, you know, it's, it's something on a weekly basis that you continue to drive and push down to your team. What you're going to get if you introduce this even to yourself and even, you know, even if you're an executive team or a company of one person at the moment is how do I find time for all of this? But the reality is if you're not driving something that is not business as usual, then you are going to be stuck in business as usual. So what, what Todd's doing with the milestones is all he has to do is ask his team once a week, are you on track for your 30 day milestone? He doesn't have to know all the details, a very quick conversation. For the most part, they get that if they say they're going to take it on, they need to be on track for the 30 day milestone. So do you want to share with the, the shift in your organization with that philosophy, Todd? Yeah, I think one of the things that probably the biggest thing I think I've seen um, within in the organization and us putting our team through this is, um, you know, Sue through her leadership is stating the facts and, and stating the facts of where you're at um, and then looking at what is so and then looking at the future and how do you get to the future. So really what you've done is you put aside all past experiences and and really what that is is that you're not there to discuss the past or you're not there to discuss, well, why I haven't achieved that. It's really saying, where am I at and why am I not achieving those goals and what obstacles are there for me to get to the future of where I need to be? And if I'm not being held accountable, then my team and why they're not being held accountable and to take those obstacles out of the way to meet that. So it's, it's something that you really start to see the team um, when you go through these weekly meetings that they tend to get on track. You know, you're, there, there's eight of us in these meetings and you really are holding people accountable. You see them step up, you see them become more confident, you see them more energetic and really taking that then down to the next level within the organization. And, and there's no real, well, you know what, I, last week Susie was out on vacation or you know what, I wasn't feeling well last week or whatever may be the case, that, just, that, don't, that don't apply, it doesn't exist anymore. Yeah, because what we're doing is we're taking away the excuses and we've just got a milestone and that's it. So now does that mean that everybody's gonna meet their milestones? The no. first time you do this, the first quarter you set, I always say it's like a practice. So like right now, we're in the middle of June. If you went from now until the end of Q3 is just a practice run, and that might be the opportunity to fix while you really get this plan in place. But the practice run, you're going to find that people are coming with all their excuses, but, but you really don't want to hear their excuses or yours. All you want to do is create a culture of people doing what they say they're going to do. Now, they can at any point, even Todd's team, can go to Todd's team and say, I would like to reconstitute my 90-day objectives. So they can change their mind on stuff or they can see that they bit off more than they could chew. So they can reconstitute, but they can only reconstitute with your permission, right, Todd? Correct. And, you know, and from that standpoint, what, you know, I, I kind of smile when I'm saying this is that, you know, I'll look at um, what they what their 90 day goal was, you know, what that 30 day goal, how that's affecting other departments or other individuals, how that's affecting myself and us hitting our 30 day and 90 day goal. And if it's something that's from a technology standpoint, like right now, we know one of our bottlenecks is our technology and, and just the amount of um, people that we have from that standpoint. I'm okay with allowing for that to be reset for maybe another 30 days, but if not, then there's times that it's, it's like, no, um, if it's off track, you know, you have a week to get it back on track and here's where we're at. And there's times that um, one or, or more than one executive will push back on me and say, listen, you know, them being off track and not meeting their commitment is, is you know, taking and affecting my team and my department. So it's, it's really something that you see the team really come together and knowing um, from that standpoint is I can't miss what I have to deliver because I just let down that other team another team member 
Yeah. And, and again, Todd, I'm sure that people come to you and say, well, I just haven't had time. What, what's the answer to that? <laughs> the answer to that is that from our standpoint, we all have time. And so what we have to take a look at is that truly your integrity. And, and from that standpoint, if you don't have the time, then you need to bring it to the team's attention or bring it to my attention before then that just says, listen, you know, I'm being upfront. I'm being honest with you. And this is what's taken place this last week. And, you know, I'm asking for one more week to meet my deadline. And um, is, is your integrity of basically saying, you know, what I'm saying I'm going to do, I will do. And if not, I'm going to hold myself accountable for it. And then that's when you take a look at it and you can adjust. So I would love some questions from you guys. We're not finished with our presentation yet. But I would really like you to start making this relevant for you and where you're at with your businesses or where you're at with your life. Um, so please throw us some questions into chat so that we can uh, really help get into some of the nitty gritty and help you dig down with your businesses and what you're up to. So please don't be shy to do that. So um, there's, a, there's a question from uh, Elise who's working on her business plan. And um, so it sounds like she's at the beginning stages. Um, any additional Thanks. advice or ideas um, yeah. when you're just yeah. starting your company? How do you use this method? For, for, well, again, so if you, so Elise is, let me just make sure that I'm clear on that, JP. So Elise is brand new start in her business. It's a brand new startup. She wants to know how to make this applicable. Yes. Okay. All right. Good. So again, Elise, what you would do is think of this as that napkin strategic plan. You've got a great idea. You're sharing it with somebody over lunch, but this is a way for you to capture powerfully the ideas that you have and what you want to accomplish. So Elise, I'm guessing that you have a five year, you have an idea for the future. By the way, it doesn't have to be five years change it up. It could be 10 years, it could be three years. But, but again, you want to throw that cap across the wall and say, this is what I want to accomplish. A lot of people fail in businesses because they, or they maybe don't fail, but it becomes a lifestyle business because they're not really clear on what it is that they want. So the, the most important thing to do, <laughs> got my cat trying to help me here. The most important thing to do is to really spend some time determining what you want for the long term. And once you've determined what you want for the long term, then nailing it down into what you need to do for the first year. And the first year could be that you're doing something. We've seen a lot of companies, uh, the, the first year they're not really even in business. The first year they're developing the, the plan, the first year they're having conversations with people, the first year they're finding themselves mentors and they might be studying at the same time, they might still be in school or they might be working at the same time. So hopefully that answers your question, but ultimately you need a longer term vision than the next six weeks and you need to be working towards something. Uh, so hopefully that answers your question, Elise, and if it doesn't, then just reach out again. Tammy has a question, are core values typically just one word? Um, as opposed to what, I ask. So, so you can feel free to answer that question, Tammy, in chat if you want, as opposed to what that. Why I like core values to be typically one word because I want my company to remember them. And if you've got three to five, you're probably gonna remember. What do you think about that, Todd? Yeah, I think the thing, you know, we looked at it and I was looking back on some, of our first notes and meetings and stuff as we talked about the core values. And I think we probably had a list of 20 words. Um, and as we narrowed them down and narrowed them down, you know, again, what it is is that within the organization and as you continue to grow the company, those are, those are the key words that whether it's on a poster board in the cafeteria or in your lunchroom, or whether it's something that you see in your um, conference room, you know, and people ask about, you know, what, it, what is this? I keep seeing these five words or, three to five words and where they're at. But once you, def once you look at those core values and you've selected that one to two words, really what Sue then looks at and from our standpoint is define what that really means. And so what we did is we took our core values and then we sent it out to the essential team. And the essential team consists of about 20 individuals. 
And of that, we asked them to define what these core values meant to them. And then we brought back those core values and so many definitions of what it really meant to them. Okay. And then we put a short definition behind it. So we know, so let's just take, for example, integrity. When we define integrity, what we're saying is that we are doing what we are saying we are going to do when we are saying we are going to do it. And what does that mean to us? That, that is our definition of integrity. So we looked at another one that says respect. What is respect on our side? Due regard for the feelings, wishes, and rights of others. So you can define those, what they mean to you within your organization, but uh, we found it um, a lot easier just to continue to have maybe one or two words that, that were each core value. Yeah, so, so that, that's great that you brought that up, Todd, because every word has a probably a sentence behind it, Tammy. Mm -hmm. And, and then ultimately, when you've got those nailed, you want to be sharing those with people. And you're not just your team, by the way, you can be sharing those words with your, uh, with your vendors, with your customers, and letting them know what you stand for in your organization. But the more present those words are for you, the more, again, you've got those guiding principles. So going on to Debbie, Debbie says, so busy working in my business, need to figure out how to work on my business. Yeah, Debbie, the thing with this is if you're not working on the business as well as in the business, and again, it doesn't matter whether you're a business of one or whether you're a business of 200, if you're not working on your business, it generally is worse than business as usual. So, so business as usual is, is fine until it's not fine anymore. But if you're not working on your business, you'll find that you stagnate or you actually start going backwards. And, and if you don't stagnate or going backwards, the best scenario is that you're maintaining a status quo. And, and for me, that's not okay because I, I do believe that there's always opportunity for growth in the business. And most of the time growth is appropriate. I am working at the moment with a couple of companies that I want to slow down their growth a little bit because I think that they're running so fast, they're growing so fast that unless they get some stability underneath of them, then that, that could also cause them problems, but that's not usually the problem. How to find employees who are willing to work <laughs> so I can work on my business. I'll leave that one for you, Todd. <laughs> Sue, I love you for that. <laughs> yeah, thought so. Um, you know, I think one of the things on our side is, um, as we see in our society and today and what's going on and um, some stuff is that it is tough to find um, good employees. But what you have to do again, um, from that standpoint is, as you define and lay out your business plan and where you're at and that short term to five year window, um, and as you define those core values, don't go off those core values, live by those core values, hire by those core values. Um, one of the things that we do when we actually are going through our interviewing process is that we'll talk about the core values um, with, an in, with the, the individual that we're interviewing and it from whether it's the receptionist at the front desk to one of the executives. And I'll ask um, from my standpoint and, and I've asked the team is that I'll throw out a couple core values and tell them what we think of them um, and what they mean and then ask them what they mean to them. Um, and if truly in that interview, you're not seeing that individual align with your core values um, whether you're looking for that help or not, that, that long-term is not someone that's going to be the right person in the right seat. And so it's tough, um, but again, it's something that you're defining and you're laying out the roadmap for your organization and your team. So um, I would say that, you know, right now, stick to those core values, stick to who you believe you are in the company that you want, and then attract talent. And, you know, one of the things that we find is, especially um, is a lot of networking. Um, whether you're involved in different societies or organizations within your um, metropolitan area, but a lot of times um, referrals and, and just networking helps us out a lot. I, I want to just add to it as well, Debbie, is it's highly unlikely that you are going to be the only one that's working on your business. And the trick is to enroll your team into working on your business as well. So again, just going back to the, the 90 day objectives on this document that you've got, there's an opportunity for you to write your company 90 day objectives 
But over and above of that, each of your employee needs at least one 90 day objective that's above business as usual. And I don't know any business owner, and Todd, you can probably speak to this as well. It's plus or minus, Todd, what percentage of your time, as even as CEO, are you working in your business versus on it? I know you've just come back from a meeting that you were definitely in your business. So it's, yeah. it's probably, probably most of your time is spent in your business, right? Yeah, and, and, and what you find, and um, <laughs> I find myself is that um, if I'm working on our business, um, I'm working on our business from 4.30 a.m. to 7 o'clock. <laughs> and unfortunately, um, or it's sometimes, um, you know, whether it's a weekend that I'm playing catch up, if I'm working on the business, it's really taking a look. Um, and I spend some of my Sunday evenings and um, I'm one that unfortunately does not require a lot of sleep, but I'll usually spend my Sunday evenings. And when I say Sunday evenings, um, anywhere from nine o'clock to 12 o'clock on Sunday, just kind of preparing for my week and looking at working on the business. And what I mean by that is taking a look at what is coming up for the week and what do I have with my weekly meetings with my management team? You know, what are the goals? Are we in line? Where do we need to be so that I can continue to work on the business? Because during the week and when you get in it, you're in the business and in the meeting. So um, unfortunately, a lot of that planning is additional um, time. Yeah. Um, going back to what you said, Tammy, uh, there about the core values as opposed to statements. Thanks for that. I didn't see it at the time when I was chatting about it. So you'll see now that the statements are there as well. And actually what Todd did was he created a speech to deliver to every employee on what the core values were. And at that point, they were working remotely already. So what he did was he video recorded the speech that he'd created so that every employee was aware of not only what the word was, but what the statement was behind the word. So hopefully that helps you. Uh, Danielle, question from Danielle. She says, can you touch on the unique challenges of owner operators and managing goals as a team of one? Yeah. So for the most part, I'm a team of one. It's not entirely true because I do have virtual assistants as well. But for the most part, as a team of one, I still have to practice what I preach, Danielle. So I'm still creating this kind of a document for myself on a fairly regular basis. So what we actually do is we create the five-year plan and then we review this quarterly. So they're looking at it. Todd's company is looking at this every week from a certain perspective to make sure that milestones are being met which is literally a three minute conversation. Are you on track for your milestone? Yes or no? You're not allowed to make excuses and that's great because the more we live in a culture where excuses and reasons and rationalizations for not getting stuff rule the day. So if all you're allowed to say is yes or no, I'm on track or no, I'm not, it gets really uncomfortable people. And that's what actually pulls them back on track. But as a, um, owner operator or a team of one, Danielle. Again, same thing applies. If you're not making plans for the future, the future just happens willy nilly. If you're not intentional about the future, you're gonna get to a future, but it might not be as powerful or as intentional as you want it to be. So for myself, I also do this. I create this uh, the same document for my own business and I'm always looking to improve so I might, it might be a branding project. These 90 day objectives become like projects for a longer term goal. And as a result of, for myself, I've probably, uh, I probably still manage on a fairly regular basis about a 25% growth year over year. And I'm not able to do that if I'm not planning for it. Todd's company is doing better than that, right Todd? Yeah, I mean, from our standpoint, I think the thing that you have to take a look at is, is really holding yourself accountable. And, um, you know, even though I have a lot of support and, and I have seven individuals that report to me um, as a CEO, is really holding yourself accountable, continuing to focus on those short term 90 day goals and breaking those down into 30 days and then really looking at those. And then if you're not hitting those goals, why are you not hitting those goals? reestablishing that. And then I think one of the big things and that you'll find um, as we went through the training and the um, leadership classes with Sue is really 
reaching out to a friend or what <laughs> um, myself or Sue or some of my colleagues is reaching out to somebody that says, hey, listen, you know what? Um, I'm running into an obstacle. Let me kind of run this by you and help me help hold me accountable for what I'm not accomplishing. And um, I would say in the smaller companies, that's what you need to try to establish is someone from a business standpoint, someone that knows, someone that you can work and then and, and know that they're going to be honest and upfront with you. Um, and from that standpoint, you know, there's times I'll call Sue and say, hey, Sue, I'm struggling with this. When do you have time that we can visit on it? And um, that's, I would say that's probably the best advice I, I can give is if it's a smaller company, um, is having someone that you can network with on this. And the other thing I think, Danielle, is making sure that there are four pieces of time that are saved to driving your business as opposed to being in your business. And I think this answers Debbie's, uh, Debbie's deal as well. You know, for example, I felt that authoring a book would be a good business calling card, if you like, for my clients. So, but to author a book takes time. So I actually had to calendar time to do the book or calendar time to plan or give myself a retreat, you know, retreat for one person's kind of fun as well, or go away and be committed to spending a little bit of a, of, of a time in your long weekend or your vacation or you just call it a retreat. But if you're not spending time working on your business, it, your business is never going to go anywhere. And I, you've seen this, I've seen this in conversation with people. They say, I want to grow my business. And my first question is, what do you want to do differently? You've been maintaining or going backward for the last five years. You're going to have to be willing to do something different if you want to drive the growth of your business. Uh, Elise, another good question from you, if I can get to it. What is the best method for determining your ideal business? So thank you, because that takes us on to a little bit here that you're um, that we haven't touched on yet. So if you go back to the first page of the master plan, and we've got this little portion called uh, marketing strategy, and it says ideal customer, why choose us? I would say start with why choose us. And we, can, we pick three uniques because everybody can say, well, our customer service is great, but not everybody can say, what are your three, Todd? Do you have them handy? Yeah, from our standpoint, it was our top three were serve. Serve. Collaboration. Collaborate with your customers. And then obviously one of the big things on our side is that um, positive. We, did, we have to maintain a positive uh, attitude every time and, and every time we're on the phone with a customer or in person with a customer. So what, what Todd's business does is like a triple A, but it's for trucks. So every, every call into Todd's business is a crisis for somebody. So they've either had an accident or they've had a breakdown or they've had a blowout of a tire. So for him, it's very important that being positive and you'll find that when you're dealing with a lot of call centers, as we all know, they're not always positive. So that makes them unique. Um, so, but if you start with your three uniques, it's kind of a, an add on to a, why do we exist and who do we exist for? So it's like, why do we exist? Who do we exist for? And how do we do what we do better than any of our competition do what, what they do? And when you know that, you should start already honing in. But another thing that I like to do, Elise, is, is if, you, if you had to take a stab, Elise, at where you're at with your business now or who your customers might be, and then you create a spreadsheet with who your customers might be, so I was working on this with a client this morning and they've got 10 kind of prospect customers, but they definitely haven't honed in on what their ideal customer is yet. So then I had them create some questions around their customers. Is uh, who are they currently using? How long have they been with them? How much does that, how much do they, do they pay? So the, the kind of hypothetical questions that start honing in for you on the, uh, on what your offer is. That's the first thing to do is really hone in on what your offer is. Because I find if you're all things for all people, it doesn't optimize your business opportunity. 
So, so once you've determined those questions, then you start answering those questions. And as you're answering those questions, you'll start honing in on who your ideal customer is. Do you want to speak to that, Todd? Yeah, I think some of the things on our side that we had to take a look at is that, you know, when the company first started and it's been in business for uh, going on 11 years, you know, to define who the ideal customer is, is at that point in time is we were trying to get, you know, work through the door. Um, and, and so you, your definition of that might be different than it is today. Today, when we look at our ideal customers, you know, we look at the standpoint of, again, the ideal customer being someone that is focused on the core values of, again, who we are, and then being able to look back. So ideal customer from our standpoint is someone that we can see that we have a long-term relationship with, that we can basically look at our future and then be able to look back at that that says, is that customer going to contribute to our future? Are they driven from technology? We know technology is a big drive that's going to improve and help increase our margins. So from a technology standpoint, are they technology and do they have the technology platform? You know, when we look at it from a standpoint, is there diversification? Are they willing and are they able to diversify in the platform of where they're at? And then one of the big things that we focus on is the ideal customer is really to take a look at their locations. Okay. Are they global? You know, where are they located? What can we do to help them expand on their site? So those are some of the big things to try to take a look at, you know, what is the ideal customer and does that fit us today? Yeah, that's, that's great. And for me with my ideal customers is, you know, sometimes you get it wrong to begin with the lease. You know, because sometimes when you're starting up, you try to be all things for all people, mm -hmm. you know, so what would happen for me and what really made a difference for me was honing in on what my offer was. And that really means honing in on what I do better than most of my competitors do. So once I honed in on what I did better than everybody else, it was very easy for me to design an offering that worked for me and that didn't need constantly reinventing. If you're constantly reinventing your offer, in fact, I think that what, what, what I could say is fairly safe for most companies is they start too broad. And then when they start honing in, they actually optimize the business opportunities. So um, I hope that answers your question. Elise, Sue, let me add something. Elise, um, I think I'm reading this correctly. Um, and let me know, um, your business plan is a bookstore wine bar downtown. Is that correct? Am I reading that right? I think so. And so I think the, I think the, the piece on that is, you know, what is the ideal customer and the thing that separates you is, you know, what is going to separate you from your top five competitors in that area? You know, what is it that is going to bring a customer in that is going to want to come in and, and what type of wine are you serving or what is your atmosphere or you know what is if you were to define your core values those core values i think are going to help describe your customer and is that the customer that you're looking for is you know is it a relaxed environment that you come in and have a glass of wine and are able to read is it a is it a high-end intense um atmosphere you know what are you looking but define really who you are with your core values and that's going to help you define your customer. Yeah, that's great. Thanks. Thanks, Todd, because I'd missed that comment from you, Lisa. I apologize. So you said you're currently finishing your business plan and you'd love any advice or ideas you have for that. I would say whatever's in your business plan, you see, we, we create business plans for different reasons. And it's really interesting because I had a conversation with John Paul before we got too much into the planning for this, uh, for this webinar this afternoon. And you might need a completely different business plan type if you're looking for funding, right? So if you're looking for funding, there would be a whole lot that we haven't included like um, uh, the fi big financial aspects, obviously, and the expectations and the projections. So it might be, at least that if you're looking for funding, you need to spend more time on that. But I don't mind at all if you reach out to me uh, separate. If we haven't answered your questions, like feel free to give me a call and I'll see what I can help you with them, some more specific advice if you need it. 
Okay, Donna, I hope you got the templates. I'm going to share that template again so that you can see it while we while we're finishing it up. Am I sharing the right thing, Todd? Yes. Okay, good. Okay, so there's the template, Donna, and uh, hopefully you've been sent one by now. And no more questions so we can move forward with what we've missed. What have we missed? Okay, on the bottom right-hand corner of the page, of the bottom page, we, we it says, what are we dealing with? Whenever you are creating a future, there's going to be what I jokingly I'm going to refer to now as the naysayers, and that, that can also apply to a team of one, is and it might be, why can't I do this? Like, why, why, all the reasons why you can't do it. So this, this far right bottom corner is the issues that get in the way of you reaching that goal. Now, for me, an issue isn't a good thing or a bad thing. It's just an obstacle. It's just the hurdle that you have to get over. And the question is always, how do we resolve this issue? So that's what you're making a list of there on the right. Now, what's joyous is right in the beginning of this process, you might have literally 100 issues. And if you've got 10 people in the meeting, you should, they should all be contributing to that issues list. An issue is not a bad thing. An issue is just what's to deal with. Right, so don't be frightened of identifying, writing down, discussing issues, and you get really good at it. What happens over time, and Todd will attest to this, is over a year, uh, when you're doing your quarterly meetings, you want to come in with new issues. So every quarter, everybody that's involved is coming in with, well, now what's, what are our issues? Because as you solve one problem, oftentimes you'll create a bigger one. You know that the automobile was was created to um, to prevent pollution in New York City. I think there was they were the trans main mode of transportation was horses and horse drawn carts, and the horses were creating a little bit of pollution on the street. Well, now we've created a bigger problem with solutions uh, with pollution, and now the new the new challenge is how do we get to electric vehicles faster? And that's going to create a problem too with batteries and all the rest of it. So so. But what should happen as well is you're identifying and solving your issues in a, in a pretty systematic format as well. Todd touched on it already. You're looking at the facts of the matter of the problem, you're brainstorming solutions, and you're creating action items that make that problem go away. Todd, what you got? I think one of the things that we were hearing from some of our essential team is, is one of the things that kept coming back that in our first meetings that was, was an issue is that we were being told that we're hard to do business with, meaning that TTN fleet solutions is hard to do business with. And so they would identify that as an issue. And so from that standpoint, what we would somewhat look at is that we'd look at the past and we'd get stuck on the past. And well, you know, we're hard to do business with because of our technology. We're hard to do business with because our phone system, we're hard to do business with because of the individuals that are here. So that, that's what I call a conversation about. So people have a lot of conversation about what's wrong and keep going Todd. Yeah. And so from that standpoint, what, what we looked at is that first state the facts of the matter so that we can understand really what the issue is and then problems, look. Problems stay problems because people talk about them conceptually and don't specifically identify what the issue is. And problems stay problems because people pile up a whole bunch of problems and sometimes you've got to separate them and deal with them one at a time. Keep going, Todd, sorry. So what you do on that is, for example, is that when we looked at it and said, okay, well, why are we hard to do business with? And so we asked to identify what those elements were. And then we took each one of those individual tasks of why we're hard to do business with and broke those down so that in our future, and the best way to do that is to create the future that says, wait, we're easy to do business with and people want to do business with us. And why do they like working with us? And then it was real easy to get from, well, you're hard to do business with to know we love doing business with you and work through what those are. And so that's the part that you have to take a look at is that state the facts of the matter, forget the past, 
and then look at what your future is, is that our goal is we want it to be easy to do business with this. And but how notice, are we? Notice that Todd didn't speak it like our goal is we're easy to do business with. He spoke it like a declaration. Remember the, the power in a declaration. He spoke it like a declaration. We are easy to do business with. And now what's in the way of that specifically and how do we get past it? But always holding on to, we are easy to do business with. Elise, stay, sit in that wine bar already. Sit in that wine bar, see the books, close your eyes, see the books around it. And then, and then the question is always, how do we make this happen? How do we get there? Like an invitation as opposed to an obstacle. Now it's an in invitation. Yeah, what have we missed, Scott, uh, Todd? Or should we just recap now, do you think? No, I think, I think the thing that Sue, um, right there with a good example to Elise, is, and it, it's, it's a process throughout the mind and, and as you work through that, but really put yourself in that future, okay? And, and what Sue has talked and what we've gone through is, you know, there's a fantasy. This is not a fantasy. This is your future. So at least place yourself in your wine bar and really jot down the top 10 things that come to your mind. Location, what I want it to fill the atmosphere, the type of wine I want to serve, the type of books I want people to have. Am I going to have something that allows for them to a comfort setting? You know, is it to where they can hear water in the background? Really create that whole future. And once you've created the future, that is your five-year plan. And then it's a lot easier to work backwards to get it. But if you don't know your future to create that future, it's hard to bring yourself or to bring your employees along with you to get to that future. That's great. Thank you, Todd. Okay, so to recap, you've got this template you now know why you're in business. You know what you stand for in your business. You've got a five-year goal. You've got some three-year specifics. You've got a one-year plan, which is probably dependent on how many people. Danielle, going back to your question of how do you operate if you're an owner-operator or a one-person business, you probably, you, you probably want to really limit yourself to three or four goals for the year because you do have to run business as usual. You do have to, even in Todd's business, like Todd has some really ambitious goals for the future and he has a business that's already generating him income. So he has to look after the generation of the income. He has to look after that cash cow while at the same time building out this new future, this new created place that, that his business is going to. So most times we can't just dump what we're doing and start something else. Most, most times there's, there's a what we're doing. That could be, in Elise's case, it might have nothing to do with the wine bar. In a fairly typical startup company, some of the kids, some of the people that are building that business might still be in school, right? So not often do we have the luxury of saying, okay, I'm gonna take all my time now and build this plan. But you've got to be working towards something. You've got uh, a good idea of your ideal customer. You've got a good idea of why you do things better than anybody else in the market. You've got your 90-day company objectives, which are the priorities for your company. Then everybody in your business also has a 90-day objective or three or seven. And then you're looking at your issues and you're solving issues and problems along the way. What have I missed, Todd? Anything? So we've no, got a few minutes left if anybody's got any last questions for us. Anything, Todd? I would just say from your standpoint is you know, don't be afraid to reach out to Sue. Um, I don't know any of you, but I'm more than willing to share my contacts and whether that be from Sue or um, the, the team here, Danielle, and that um, you can reach me by my cell phone. You can reach me through email um, just to try to, you know, have a network that you can bounce ideas off of and work with someone. Um, but I think the thing that Sue says is really what it is, is, you know, take that visionary that you have in your mind and break it down and put it down on paper, put it down on your plan, 
give your plan a name and then stick to that core value of who you are and what you believe. Okay, I think um, I think we got everything covered. Oh, here we got one more. I work in a niche market and encounter brand loyalty when attempting to approach potential customers. How can I utilize my core values and mission to differentiate myself? Yeah, that's a great question, James. Um, and it's something that virtually every custom, every new business or every business of any description is going to be dealing with people who already have a provide a service provider. So I would say that one of the most important things for you is persistence and grit. And this is kind of a funny story. You get in your own way on this. It's a great story to finish with. I looked at doing business with TARD and TTN for probably two years before I had a conversation with TARD. And I kept reaching out to Todd and saying, hey, Todd, I'd love to have a conversation with you. Hey, Todd, how about we meet on Zoom for 15 minutes? And sometimes I got no response. And sometimes I got, I'm a bit busy, try again in a month. And when, when we, and uh, you know, what rings in your head is I, I need to stop bothering him, right? I need to stop pushing myself on him. And the very first thing that Todd said to me when we finally met on Zoom was, Sue, thank you for persisting in your attempts to get me on board. And I think that Todd would tell you now that it's been great for his company and for me. So I would say persistence and grit is the number one way to keep your business in people's eyes. You only need to just reach out to them on the right day. Uh, and that, that makes all the difference. Yeah. Well, on, on that note, Sue, I'm going to jump in and um, help wrap us up here. I think um, landing on persistence and the importance of determination and grit and all those things that kind of go into the, the meaning of that word persistence is, is a great way to end because um, whether it's a startup or a small business, uh, it is going to be hard and um, you need to have good advice and good mentors. But most importantly, you've, you've got to be committed to the journey and you've got to be determined. So I want to thank Todd and Sue for um, sharing their uh, wisdom on this topic today. And I also want to uh, encourage those of you who maybe haven't signed up to be a free member of Kite, please go to our website where you can sign up for free resources and make sure you're on our newsletter so that you can get informed about future webinars and events and things that we're doing. We rally around entrepreneurship here in Kern County. That website is gokite.org. And I'll point you to a couple of things underneath the connect menu. Uh, we have a link to where our podcast is, is hosted. We do have a monthly podcast where you can hear from other entrepreneurs who are doing interesting things in our community uh, or elsewhere in the world that are relevant to our community. And also to sign up um, and get access to our resource compass and community hub, click on the Kite Community Hub and then join us. Again, everything is entirely free and uh, we hope to see you again at a future Kite event webinar. Um, and um, we look forward to supporting you all in your journey. Thanks again to Sue and Todd, Danielle and Richard and um, we'll see you guys soon. Have a great afternoon.